this is Dr. Melissa Stiles with the Department of Family Medicine, and welcome to today's Fan Medcast on Hypertension. I'm very happy to be joined again by Dr. Patrick McBride, Professor of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin. Thanks for joining me again, Dr. McBride. Thank you, Dr. Stiles. When you talked about hypertension, you talked about the top 10 problems in treating hypertension. What are they? Well, with apologies to David Letterman, let me tell you about some really important problems. Uh, first, a lack of public awareness is really important. A lot of people aren't aware that they have high blood pressure and that awareness and doing any kind of screenings we can do are critically important because it's an asymptomatic condition. Second is that a lot of physicians aren't aware that systolic blood pressure is the single biggest predictor of stroke, heart failure, kidney failure. A lot of people think diastolic blood pressure is more important, but systolic blood pressure is the biggest predictor of outcomes. The next is not treating it. So people keep uh, putting it off and thinking it's white coat hypertension or it's because they're anxious that day, and that's a big mistake. And you really ought to be able to recognize that in older people over the age of 40 or 50, it's usually really hypertension. The next is really the failure to recognize that lifestyle changes really have a big impact on high blood pressure, which we'll talk about. This idea that office blood pressure is higher is often true, but it's usually for younger people and not older people. And have people take blood pressures at home because they are more predictive than office pressures, but don't just assume that they don't have high blood pressure. Knowing that blood pressure rises with age is really important, but that increases risk. It's not that just because it increases with age, it's not a risk. And it's very important to recognize that most people with high blood pressure are going to require two medications at least. And it's also most important to recognize, and I'll mention this many times, that most patients should be considered to be on a thiazide diuretic. It's the most effective medication that we have, and it's best in combination. So we'll talk about combinations and what's really important, and, and it's also important to pick the right medicine for the right person. Patients and providers really underestimate the benefits of therapy. We have phenomenal medications for blood pressure, many of which don't even have any more side effects than placebo. And people often assume that their life is going to be affected negatively when in fact it could have long-term major benefits. And the number one problem is lack of adherence. So about 50% of people who are given a high blood pressure medicine aren't taking it as prescribed. In fact, about 20% of people don't even take the prescription to the drugstore. What are the goals for blood pressure control and how do they differ for certain conditions? There is some confusion and there shouldn't be because it's very simple. The goal for most patients is a blood pressure on treatment of less than 140 over 90. For patients with diabetes and now renal disease, it's now recommended that it be less than 130 over 80. Initially, there were some differences, but to simplify recommendations and based on new data, the goal for patients with diabetes and kidney disease is less than 130 over 80. We hear a lot about starting with non-pharmacological treatment for hypertension, such as weight loss, limiting alcohol, dietary changes, increasing physical activity, tobacco cessation, and reducing sodium. How effective are these measures? Very. I could sum it up very simply like that, but let me say this, that blood pressure is exquisitely sensitive to weight loss. So a five or 10 pound weight loss will normalize blood pressure in most patients we see. So if they're told that, that's a big incentive. Most patients that I see with resistant blood pressure, it's a combination of things, and a lot of times it's lifestyle. So with modest weight loss, reduction or stopping alcohol, and decreasing sodium, for those patients, that alone would make their blood pressure no longer resistant. So if patients would combine healthy eating, stopping alcohol, or limiting it to social occasions and making these changes, many of these patients would either not need a medication or could be on less medication. Let's turn to pharmacologic treatment. For a person with essential hypertension, which drug would you choose? You've mentioned thiazides in the beginning. Uh, the first thing is you should tailor the medication to a person's indication. So there are compelling indications for certain medications that you should see if you have first. So for example, a diabetic patient, the first thought should be an ACE inhibitor because if a person has glucose intolerance or diabetes, you can either prevent diabetes or significantly reduce the complication of diabetes. So that's of course also true for a patient with heart disease or heart failure your first thought should be an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker. So for post-MI, that's a compelling indication. 
For a person with stroke, uh, the first choice should be a thiazide diuretic and the second choice should either be an ACE inhibitor or a calcium blocker because we know in the elderly that those two medications are the most effective. That's a thiazide, calcium blocker, ACE inhibitor. Those are the most effective for stroke prevention. In chronic kidney disease, especially if it's mild to moderate chronic kidney disease, the first choice should be an ACE inhibitor and the second choice should be a diuretic. If the kidney disease is mild, then it could be a thiazide, but it, it should be a loop diuretic if the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, is less than 50. Other than that, I usually say you should find a reason not to use a thiazide diuretic because the first choice for most patients would be a thiazide diuretic because the evidence is very compelling, very strong that the thiazide diuretic is most effective at lowering blood pressure. It's more effective than all other classes. And it also has the best outcomes in terms of reducing events. There are multiple studies that show this, the most important being the recent ALHAT study, which studied lots of different patient groups. And it showed that in patients of color, male and female patients, old and young, thiazide diuretics were as are more effective than all other classes of medications. One question on thiazides. I often see people on 50 milligrams. Can you expand on the optimal dose and side effects? That's a great question because it's really important to recognize that m many people, especially the elderly, would respond to 12.5 milligrams of a thiazide diuretic. And nearly all patients, 25 milligrams is the dose that they should be on. Generally, a dose higher than 25 milligrams is not only not any more effective, but it could cause higher side effects, such as hypokalemia or other side effects. Uh, the only time I go to 50 milligrams of a thiazide diuretic based on literature is if the patient is large. So if I have a very big male patient or an obese patient, I'll occasionally go to 50 milligrams, but that's pretty unusual. Usually, you'll get no more benefit going higher than 25 milligrams in blood pressure. If the blood pressure is not at goal with the initial medication, how do you decide between stopping that medicine and substituting another or adding another agent from a different class? Uh, a common error in blood pressure treatment is uh, not achieving blood pressure in one medication. They stop the medicine and start another one. Really, you have to remember that most patients are going to need two or more. At least two-thirds of patients with high blood pressure require at least two. So the smartest thing to do is start the right medicine for a compelling indication or starting with a diuretic and then adding a second medication. And if you want to improve adherence, combination medications are the smartest way to do that because most people would take one pill rather than two. So a good example of that is if you've started one medication uh, like an ACE inhibitor or any other medication, the next choice should probably be a thiazide diuretic. So it's very important to recognize that a thiazide diuretic is synergistic with every other class of medications because every other antihypertensive increases plasma volume and then a diuretic will reduce plasma volume and be synergistic with every other class. What are the potential causes for inadequate response to drug therapy? The most important causes for inadequate response to other therapy is number one, non-adherence to therapy, number two, non-adherence to therapy, and number three, non-adherence to therapy. So that's what you should be, and we're not very good judges at who does that. But to also mention the other causes, I frequently find things like people taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatories every day, so ibuprofen, naproxen, etc. Alcohol is common, high sodium. And then you start to think about secondary causes. We find a secondary cause for hypertension in the range of about 5 to 10 percent, depending on the age of the patient. So you want to be thinking about those sorts of things. On a regular basis, you should be checking electrolytes and a urine, and then occasionally an EKG in a patient with high blood pressure looking for things like hypokalemia, renal disease. And then you start to think about resistant hypertension if somebody's not responding. The definition of resistant hypertension is someone that's on three or more medications uh, not achieving blood pressure goal, one of which has to be a diuretic. Let's expand on the point of non-adherence. Can you give your recommendations for improving adherence to therapy? 
Yeah, that's a really important question and really tough. It takes the art of medicine at this point. And, and one thing is to really help people know what blood pressure is and that it's a long-term problem and that the benefits of the medicine far outweigh any risks. And um, I find a lot of good um, help by explaining exactly what high blood pressure is and also that it reduces risk of stroke. So when I talk about stroke and heart failure and trying to uh, personalize the treatment to something in their family that are them particularly, that really helps. When I describe that pressure is built up in the arteries and what can happen, I think that helps quite a bit. When I really ask people how often they take it, I also tell them that I take medicine regularly and that it's not easy for me to remember and it might not be easy for them to remember as well. That oftentimes creates kind of an understanding and people are generally more honest. If you're at all suspicious, and you're not getting the truth, then I often will call the pharmacy and ask how often the medicine is filled. And how often do you recommend in terms of follow-up for patients to come back in? If you put a patient on a medicine for the first time or increase or add a new medicine, you should see them in a month. And the biggest mistake I see is people putting somebody on a medicine and say, I'll see you in three months or four months or six months. You can guarantee decreased adherence. You can guarantee about 50% adherence at that point because blood pressure is an asymptomatic condition. And people are gonna take a medicine and all they're gonna get out of that is worrying about the medicine. So if you can show them in three to four weeks that their blood pressure is better, that's gonna be a powerful reinforcer that the medicine's working. And in summary, what are the key points uh, in treating hypertension that you see? Number one is good community screening regular good practice. I will tell you that it's very important to teach your medical assistants to do good blood pressure screening. There are many errors made at that level. Physicians should follow up if the pressure is not normal and check it themselves. Secondly, don't forget the importance of lifestyle. Uh, nutrition can drop blood pressure at least 10 to 12 millimeters, both systolic and diastolic. Third, pick the right agent for the right patient. In general, find a reason not to use a thiazide diuretic because they often should be first or second line. And last, be sure to follow up regularly with your high blood pressure patients. Teach them to get a blood pressure cuff, and they're the one with blood pressure. They should be the one following. Dr. McBride, thank you very much. You're welcome.